BAM! Mr. Teru, in this lesson we are going to learn something extremely cool. We are going to learn how to find the volume of three-dimensional objects using something called the disk method. So we're going to be able to learn how to find the volume of things that are more complicated than just like cylinders and cones. We're going to do that, or be able to do that, if we know a function which describes the outer shape of a region. And that is going to set up uh, what we have here, a plane region. I've got a region that is bound by the x-axis, the y-axis, and this parabola is defining the outside uh, curve of this going up to an x value of 3. Now, we're going to do this by expanding our knowledge of the first fundamental theorem of calculus, where we estimated the area of a plane region using rectangles. And we know that uh, as we let the widths of these individual rectangles approach zero, the number of them increased until infinity, thus giving us a nearly 100% accurate estimation of the area of that plane region. Well, if we allow that to rotate around an axis, what we would get is a bunch of cylinders, and we can find the volume of a cylinder, it's pi r squared times height. And if we, again, as we reduce the widths of the cylinders, we are going to get a more and more accurate estimation of the volume. And that means that we'll be able to find questions like, well, if I had a function describing the outside of this light bulb, how much volume does it have? How much air? Uh, well, actually, it's in a vacuum, right? But how much volume does this glass hold? How much glass did it take to make this wine glass? Or how much does it hold inside of it, volume-wise? And uh, this is kind of a boring example because uh, this is just a disc of uh, or stack of uh, DVDs and it is thus a cylinder and we can just do pi r squared times the height. But, you know, we could also find the volume of all these individual discs and add them up and thus get an estimation, uh, in that case an exact estimation I will, uh, of the volume of that larger cylinder that all those small little cylinders make up. So let's see here, the function is going to define the radius of each of these uh, disks or right rectangular cylinders. Uh, and delta x, if we have uh, a horizontal axis of rotation, is going to describe uh, the heights of those disks. Let's get this out of the way and just read formally what I've said. If a region in a plane is revolved about a line, the result is called a solid of revolution. The line is called the axis of revolution. In this case, that axis of revolution would be my x-axis, or y equals zero. The simplest region in a plane is a rectangle. Now, I've covered up that diagram here, but um, again, the simplest region, uh, plane region, is a rectangle, and those getting rotated around an axis is going to set up the, move my picture in a picture here, uh, resulting, if we rotate those, uh, is a plane, is a rectangle which results in the simplest such solid, a right uh, circular cylinder, which we will be calling disks. Thus, we're finding the volume, or estimating the volume of three-dimensional objects using the disk method. All right, let me get this cleared off and get to our next page of notes. Bam! Now, how do you find volume of disks when you have a whole bunch of them? Uh, let's put this in some calculus uh, notation. Volume of a disk is delta V is equal to pi times r squared delta x. We can see that pi r squared times height that we had back in geometry. Approximating the volume of a solid uh, by n disks of widths delta x and radius r of x sub i. Now on the next screen we're going to, I'm going to give you some nice summaries. I'm kind of building up to what we see here uh, is our formula based off our first fundamental theorem of calculus or using definite integration. And we'll summarize based on whether we have a horizontal axis of symmetry or vertical one. Now if we have a function in terms of x and we see a delta x here, we're talking about a horizontal axis of uh, rotation and these disks, if you will, are kind of vertical. So the, or the heights of them is determined by delta x. The volume is approximately equal to the summation of where we have i starting at 1 and going up to n. This is the number of disks that we are, of course, using to estimate our volume. Uh, so we have the summation of pi, capital R, of x sub i squared times delta x. 
And if we want to go ahead and just go right to that, uh, using those definite integrals, allowing the delta x to approach zero, we have the limit is exactly equal to the limit as delta approaches zero, again, of pi times the summation of r uh, of x sub i squared times delta x, where i starts at one and goes to uh, n. Now, n is approaching infinity. Uh, we have a set uh, difference here of b minus a. This would be our lower and upper limit on the x-axis if we have a, again, horizontal axis of symmetry. So we have a set difference, and if we let n go to infinity, that is going to drive the widths of all of those disks down to zero. So indeed, as we let delta approach zero, we're actually saying that we're letting n approach infinity, thus uh, giving us an infinite number of disks and then basically a, uh, an infinitely accurate estimation of the volume. The width of the largest subinterval of a partition uh, delta is the norm, which is denoted by the delta surrounded by these uh, what looks like double absolute value symbols. So we're saying that our largest partition is going to approach zero, thus all the other partitions, if they happen to be of different widths. If you remember that back when we were estimating area of a plane region using an infinite number of rectangles, well, if the largest subinterval approaches zero, then all of them are going to as well. And ultimately, we get into sort of what we're going to be using through all these examples, which is pi times the definite integral from a to b of, again, r of x sub i squared uh, times d of x. And that's going to be pi, basically, r squared times the height. All right, let's get a summary statement uh, up here for when we have, again, that horizontal and vertical axis of revolution before we get to our first example. No, 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 no. Horizontal axis of revolution. Uh, this side of the board kind of meets the uh, or matches the notation so far I've used in our video. The volume of, of uh, a solid using the disk method is equal to pi times the definite integral from a to b. That's the lower uh, value along the x-axis and the upper value, our lower and upper limits, of r of x squared dx. And if we have a horizontal axis of rotation, then we have uh, perpendicular representative rectangles with a width of delta x. So here is our horizontal axis of uh, revolution, and we'll be drawing those representative rectangles, again, like I just read, uh, vertically, and we will have a width of delta x or d of x. So we will be integrating with respect to x or dx. Now, if we have a vertical axis of revolution, then the volume is equal to pi times the definite integral from c to d. Our lower and upper limits, of course, are a lower and upper uh, value of y of r of y squared dy. Now, not only do you see that we're integrating with respect to y because we have a vertical axis of uh, rotation as opposed to over here integrating with respect to x, but we have an r of x and an r of why? So when we want to uh, rotate a solid around a vertical axis, we'll have to make sure that our function is x in terms of y, as opposed to over here where our function is uh, y in terms of x. Now, <clears throat> and it would be a good idea to make sure, you know, like look at your picture uh, or, you know, draw it or get it in your calculator and uh, you know, look at that vertical axis of rotation, draw those representative rectangles, and then once you have those representative tr uh, rectangles drawn, you can see, well, are my widths dy or are my widths dx, just to make sure that you're setting the problem up correctly. Now, r is the uh, distance from the axis of rotation and the function. Our first couple of examples are going to have either the x-axis or the y-axis uh, be the axis of rotation. So it's going to appear like we're just taking the function uh, that is describing uh, sort of the more regular uh, shape of our solid and squaring it. But our third example, I believe it is in my notes, we're going to have a solid with a hole in it. So we're going to need to remember that, you know, if like say if this is the the y-axis, uh, then my axis of revolution is going to be x equals zero. So it's going to be the value of my function minus zero. So it's going to just seem like I'm taking my function and squaring it. But maybe if this red line is the axis of revolution, then as I rotate this plane region around, I'm going to have a hole. Well, that radius, and this is going to be more, a bit more of a complicated example, but you know, I would have this overall distance here, and then I would have to subtract uh, this distance. So you will need to remember that 
R is not just the function describing the outside of your solid squared. It is the distance from the axis of rotation and the function. So we'll get more into that as we get to our third example. But right now, we got to get to our first one. Bang! For our first example, uh, we are going to set up and evaluate the integral that gives the volume of a solid formed by revolving uh, this region here about the x-axis. And before I get that started though, on the previous screen I misspoke a little bit. Our third example is going to have an axis of revolution that is not the x or y axis, but it's not going to have a hole in the solid. We're going to save that for the fourth uh, example. So uh, we're still going to have to take some special care into making sure that we set up that r function, that radius, uh, correctly that we're going to be squaring uh, in the problem. But it doesn't have, it doesn't have to have a hole in the solid for you to need to maybe take some special care in setting up that r function. So we have a parabola opening down. We see that we have one squared term. So we have y is equal to negative x minus 3 squared plus 9. And that's this uh, parabola here. We also have our region bound by the line y equals 0, which is the x-axis. x equals 0, which is the y-axis. And x is equal to 5. So we've got it drawn. We recognize that we have a horizontal axis of revolution. So I've drawn one representative rectangle, which is perpendicular or vertical. And we see that the width is equal to dx. So now I know that I'm just making sure that I'm going to integrate with respect to x. Uh, thus, my function needs to be y in terms of x, and it already is. You also want to make sure that you draw the picture, if the book doesn't give you one, before you go through this process of finding the volume of the solid that's being, uh, uh, you know, revolved around an axis. Because, uh, we don't have the issue with this one, it's the first example, but, you know, maybe that parabola, what if it had crossed through the x-axis, and part of the area was below the x-axis and part of the area was above the x-axis. Well, we'd have some negative sums and some positive sums and we would have to find the, the total volume of our revolved solid in two different parts, not just one. So make sure uh, that you get those pictures drawn and you pay attention to that before you get started. Uh, we'll have that issue uh, come up as we go through these more and more complicated examples. There's going to be a lot in this video and you'll find them all footnoted in the description. So the volume of this uh, solid, once we revolve it around the x-axis, is going to be found by doing pi times the definite integral from 0 to 5 of, now, our radius. Our radius is, or the heights of these rectangles, are going to be found by taking the, the y value from our function and subtracting it with uh, the y value from the bottom. Well, that's just going to be y equals zero, and that's why it seems like we're just taking the function and we're squaring it. But it's going to be the function minus zero, uh, and that height is, of course, negative x minus three squared plus nine, and that is going to be our uh, function giving us the radius of each disk, or the again, the length of each of these rectangles that are going to get revolved squared dx. Now we've done a lot of uh, finding definite uh, integrals. To speed this video up a little bit, I'm going to step off and just reveal this solution and then go over them step by step. All right, so we uh, took the binomial and squared it. We distributed the negative and combined some like terms and ended up with six minus x squared. Now we can go ahead and apply that extra or that outside power of two. Uh, get x to the fourth minus 12x cubed plus 36x squared dx. And just going through the power rule, we have, uh, we're gonna increase the, each of these powers by one and then divide, so increasing 4 to 5 and dividing by 5, increasing 3 to 4 and dividing by 4, and so on. And just uh, continuing on, finishing up our process of finding the definite integral. And the volume of this, uh, this uh, plane region, so, you know, rotated and draw the, I can't draw the three-dimensional figures for all these, I'd be uh, not that, quite that good of an artist, but taking this plane region, revolving it around the x-axis, we would get a volume of 250 pi or approximately equal to 785 cubic units. Now, what would happen if we were taking a function, I'm not going to do the same one, but taking a function and revolving it around the y-axis, thus giving us horizontal representative rectangles. 
Let's see what that looks like. So our second example, find the volume of a solid formed by revolving the region bound by the function y is equal to x raised to the two-thirds power, x is equal to zero, our y-axis, and y is equal to three. Uh, and we're going to revolve that about the y-axis, or revolve it about the line x is equal to zero. <clears throat> so I've got it drawn. We have an intersection point here of 0, 0, and the function stays to the right of our axis of rotation through the entire, uh, I guess if you will, the domain uh, or the range, the, the values of 0 to 3. So this is just going to look a little bit different than the past example, but really not be that much more complicated. Uh, all we need to do is, because we see that we've drawn a representative rectangle perpendicular to the axis of rotation, and we have a delta y. So we're going to uh, integrate with respect to y, which means that we need this in terms of x in terms of y, not y in terms of x. So we're going to take this equation, raise both sides of it to a power of 3 over 2, so that we can have these uh, power to powers cancel out, giving us x is equal to y to the 3 halves power. Now the volume is going to be equal to pi times a definite integral. Our lower limit on y is 0, and our upper limit defined by the problem is 3 times r of x squared, r of x, the radius. Okay, so the radius. Uh, how long is this orange rectangle? Well, it's equal to, uh, we're going to take the, the well, we're going to plug in y and get the x values from the function, and then we're going to subtract that with, or, or, you know, the distance is going to go from that x value back here to 0. So it's x minus uh, 0, and x is defined by y to the 3 halves power. So it's just simply going to be y to the 3 halves power squared dy. And that means that we're going to take uh, three, uh, y to the 3 halves powers and square it. That's going to give us pi times a definite integral of 0 to 3 of y cubed dy. Then we're going to just use the power rule and integrate this and get pi times 1 fourth y to the fourth power, uh, again with those lower limits of 3 and 0. And applying that, we get pi is times 1 fourth times 3 to the fourth power minus 1 fourth times 0 to the fourth power, of course putting in our lower and upper limits, but that's just going to be 0, so I'm just writing that uh, for teaching purposes. And this comes out to be 3 to the 4th power is 3, 9, 27, 81 over 4 pi cubic units. And that would be the volume of this solid bounded again by this uh, function y is equal to x to the 2 thirds power, y equals 0, and y equals 3. And that would kind of look like a funnel, if you will, coming down vertically to a point at the bottom. Uh, one last example in this part of the video uh, where we have solids that don't have holes in them. Uh, and it will have an axis of rotation that is not an x or y axis. Third and last example of finding the volume of a solid uh, that is created by rotating basically just one function about a line where there's no hole in it. Uh, <clears throat> find the volume of a solid formed by revolving a region bounded by y is equal to the square root of x, y is equal to 0, and x is equal to 4 about the line x equals 4. Okay, well, I've got our function drawn. It's just y equals the square root of x, and the square root of 0 is 0, and the square root of 4 is equal to 2. So let's go ahead and fill that in. And as I draw my representative rectangle, which is perpendicular to the axis of rotation, I see that my rectangle is actually laying on its side. And so we are going to be integrating with respect to y, not with respect to x. So we need to take this equation and turn it around and uh, get it y in terms of x. So that's not going to be too difficult. We have y is equal to the square root of x. We're going to square both sides and get x is equal to y squared. 
and that means we also need to get that we needed that upper limit of y there so we have again uh, we have a zero down here and a y value of two so we're going to be finding the definite integral between zero and two and that means that the volume is going to be equal to pi times the definite integral from zero to two of well i've kind of hinted all along we need to put some more thought into you know what is this r of x this this radius well my axis of rotation is way out here at x equals 4, not x equals 0 or y equals 0. So how long is this rectangle? Well, no matter how far up the y-axis I go, and, and my y is now my sort of independent variable, I'm going to put the y in and find x. Well, as I go up the y-axis, my largest value of x, this axis of symmetry, sort of uh, the base of this rectangle, if you will, or the right side of this rectangle, is 4 units away. So r of x is equal to some kind of value of 4, but my rectangle doesn't go from x equals 4 all the way back to the y-axis. It stops. Well, what's this distance? Well, I'm putting uh, in values of y, and I'm getting uh, values of x. So this distance is y squared. So from x equals 0 to my um, uh, axis of rotation, I have four units, and this little piece here is y squared, so the length of my rectangles are going to be 4 minus y squared. And that is my r of x. That's my function that is describing the length of each of these rectangles, or the uh, radius of each of these disks that I'm going to use to estimate the volume. So it's going to be 4 minus y squared, Yes, squared dy. And now, um, again, I'm doing a lot of examples. Let me just step off and reveal these solutions, uh, or the, the solution, uh, one step at a time. All right, well, the workbook looks extremely similar to our previous problems. I just, just took this binomial, squared it, used the power rule to integrate, finish up the process of finding the definite integral and the volume of this solid formed by taking this region and rotating it around the line x is equal to 4 comes out to approximately 53.62 cubic units. Now, so far, three examples have not had any holes in our solids after the revolution uh, about the axis. But let's just say we wanted to revolve this region about the line of x equals 6. Well, we would have a hole in it. It would kind of look like a donut. So let me get this cleared off, give you a set of notes of how to approach those problems if uh, the axis of rotation isn't really sort of one of the boundaries of our region and finish up that example and I'm actually going to give you two more the last one's going to be quite complicated algebraically uh, it'll still, still be some polynomials but uh, quite the irregular shape all right I'm looking for the remote but a uh, different camera there isn't one all right let's get to those notes So, as we can see in our notes here, if you get your diagram drawn, uh, you look at the, you know, the bound region and the axis of rotation, if you notice there's going to be a hole in that, uh, that, that, that volume of revolution, then we're going to let lowercase r represent the inner radius and the uh, capital R represent the outer radius. And then, you know, I have this drawing set up. It's not the, the region that we're about to find or the, the solid that we're about to find in our first, uh, or not our first example, but our next example. But we do have a delta y or d sub y or d of y because we have that vertical axis of rotation. So if we do have a vertical axis of rotation, the volume is going to be pi times the definite integral from c to d of r of y squared minus lowercase r of y squared. Uh, dy. And what you can see with each of these disks that were these infinite number of disks that we're going to use to find the volume of our uh, solid of rotation or our solid, uh, that we're just going to basically be finding the volume of each of these disks and then coming through and just cutting the center out with that subtraction right there. So that's what the formula looks, look, looks like. Let's see what it looks like in practice. 
So now we have our uh, notes out of the way. Let's get back to that previous example. Everything's going to be the same except for our axis of revolution is going to go from x equals 6 to x, excuse me, x equals 4 to becoming x equals 6. And this time I went ahead and tried my best to draw the revolution of the solid so we can see that hole going through. Uh, or you're starting from scratch, you draw the function, you draw the boundaries that you're trying to encompass, you put the axis of rotation and you go, oh wait a minute, the axis of rotation isn't actually part of my uh, plane region. So again, I'm going to have that hole. Once you recognize that, don't forget, the area of a uh, solid using the disk method is pi times, uh, in, you know, with revolution, uh, definite integral from C to D of capital R of Y squared minus lowercase r Y squared D Y in this particular case because we have a vertical axis of rotation. So we need to figure out, uh, all, well all things being the same, so our lower and upper limits are still going to be 0 and 2. Remember I just moved the axis of rotation. I can't find a disk with a hole in it. I need, to, I need to find the volume of a larger disk and then subtract out the area of the inner disk. So uh, I can't just say, well, how, how long is this, you know, orange rectangle? I need to find capital R, a function that would give me capital R of Y. So as I work my way again up the Y axis, uh, my axis of rotation is X equals 6. So Initially, this rectangle, before we take out the center area, has to reach from x equals 6 over to wherever the function is. So it's going to be uh, from x equals 0, 6, and then minus, I want to take out this section right here as I work my way up towards 2, and that distance is found by, well, x is equal to y squared. So that's this little piece right here, very similar to the last problem. Except before, with the axis of symmetry, or the axis of rotation, excuse me, being at x equals 4, that radius was 4 minus y squared. Well, now my axis is at x equals 6, so it's 6 minus y squared. And then my inside radius, the part that we want to subtract out, well, that's just a constant difference of 2. But again, thinking about working my way up the y-axis and then seeing these distances away from uh, you know, where x is equal to 0 basically, how far is that? Well, that's a distance of 6, and then I want to take out this distance of 4 to give me a constant inside radius, uh, in this particular case, that we have of 2. Now, <clears throat> that I have my two radiuses set up, again, from my axis of rotation, my large outside radius, and my inside radius, I can finish filling up my formula here, which is going to be uh, capital R of Y, which is going to be 6 minus Y squared, squared minus my inside radius, which is a constant value of 2, squared, dy. And now, just uh, I'm going to step off if you want to try this on your own, but I'm going to reveal it step by step uh, so that you can too. All right, so I took that binomial, I squared it, I combined like terms, I went through the process of finding the integral, uh, did the definite integral, and came up with the volume of this solid, which is equal to 192 over 5 pi cubic units, or approximately equal to 4,632.47 cubic units. If you're still watching, I got one more example. It is going to have some functions which are intersecting within the lower and upper limits of which we're trying to find the volume. So we're actually going to have to find two definite integrals uh, or two different volumes and add them together. And that's going to be the increase of difficulty in that particular problem if you're still watching. I certainly hope so. Bam! Bam! All right, let's get this last example finished. Find the volume of the solid generated by revolving the region bounded by the graphs of the equation y equals x squared plus 2 and y equals negative x squared plus 4x plus 8 uh, and x equals 0 and x equals 4 about the x-axis. So 
that means that if we're, if we're revolving about the x-axis, we're going to have vertical representative rectangles. And we are going to, again, uh, have a lower and upper bound on the x-axis of 0 and 4. I see that I have a parabola. Basically, this is a pretty basic one. It's just got a vertical shift of 2. So, And I'm going to draw a better sketch here in a second. But we have a parabola opening up with that one squared term and a positive leading coefficient. And this one's a bit more of a complicated parabola. So if I just pull this out on the side, and I'm going to get that into standard form. y minus 8, moving this over to the left, is equal to negative x squared plus 4x. You have to complete the square to get a parabola into standard form. So we're going to factor that negative out. And I'm also going to leave some space because I know that I'm going to need to complete the square. Okay, we're going to take half of that 4 and uh, square it. So half of 4 is 2. Squared is equal to 4. And now we've added 4 to the right, but we haven't really added 4. There's a negative out front. So we actually sort of added a 4, but there is a... Really, it's not an addition of 4, it's a subtraction of 4. So we end up with y minus 12 is equal to negative x. Now, this is a perfect square trinomial, of course. We know that. Well, there's not a power of 2 on the, outside, on the inside there. But we have y minus 12 is equal to negative x minus 2 squared. So we have a parabola opening up that's got a vertex at 2, 12, and it's opening down. Well. That means that we're going to have to find a region here bound between 0 and, well, is it bound between 0 and 4? Or is there an intersection point somewhere within this interval? And actually going to give us two separate problems. Because if these graphs intersect somewhere between 0 and 4, uh, we'll remember finding area bound between two functions. You have to do the greater function minus the uh, lesser function, and then they swap places, or they might swap places if they intersect before we get to x equals 4. So we need to find out where these graphs intersect, and to speed up the video a little bit, I'm going to set these equations equal to each other and show the work to see if they intersect between 0 and 4. So as you can see by our algebra, we have set the equations equal to, equal to each other and uh, got to a point where they intersect, these functions intersect at the values of 3 and negative 1. Well, 3 is the one that is the intersection value that is between our boundary of 0 and 4. So that's really all I'm concerned about. I've done a better job of drawing our sketch. And indeed, we see that our function, this downward opening parabola, negative x squared plus 4x plus 8, is the greater function or the outside radius from 0 to 3, and then they switch places. So we're going to have to find a volume that is created by this region rotated around the line uh, y equals 0 or the x-axis, and then we're going to have to find another volume of this region, and that region is going to be done by seeing that our function x squared plus 2 is the outside radius, where the inside radius is uh, the other function. So we're going to have to find two different volumes and add them together. So let's get this erased. And we've got volume 1, or v sub 1, is equal to the uh, pi times the definite integral from 0 to 3 of our outside radius. Now, again, our axis here is y equals 0. So it's going to be uh, whatever value, y value, we get from our outer uh, function or from negative x squared plus 4x plus 8 minus y equals 0. So it's going to just be that function squared. So we've got negative x squared plus 4x plus 8 squared minus uh, that <clears throat> inner radius, which is going to be this function, and again, we're referencing it from y equals 0, so it's going to look like it's just that function being squared. And this all, of course, integrating with respect to x because we have a horizontal uh, axis of rotation. So let's step, off, off, uh, step out and reveal this solution in one step at a line, uh, one step at a time.
All right. Uh, as we saw, those graphs did intersect at that value of 3. So we have a definite integral from 0 to 3, uh, giving us a volume after the rotation of 848.23 cubic units, approximately. And then setting up another definite integral from 3 to 4, we have another volume, which is approximately equal to 362.33, giving us a total volume of 1,210.56 cubic units. Hope all these examples help. I'm Mr. True. Bam! Go do your homework.